of the Indian Sociological Society. I welcome Professor Ganesh. Good morning. Thank you very much for that introduction. Dr. Didar Singh, Professor Kavita Sharma, Professor A.C. Sinha, Mr. Jitendra Soni, Dr. Mahalingam, Dr. Sadanan Sahu and other friends from the Global Research Forum and delegates. I'm really very happy to be here and participate in this conference. I know several members of the GRFDT team for some years, team for some years now, and I have great appreciation for their commitment to the field, for their energy, resourcefulness, networking, and also very substantial work that is being done. The theme of this conference is broad and encompasses crucial aspects of migrant and diasporic life and critical issues in the field of diaspora studies. The actual mix of papers to be presented, as you will see in the schedule, is even more varied and rich. Several aspects of development and their implications are taken up, and it is noteworthy that migration both within and outside India are included in the same forum. Very often they are separated in different fora. Further, diasporas living within India, such as Siddhis, Rohingyas, Afghanis, Arabs, and Tibetans are also discussed. The conference is not only about India. Other sender countries, like Bangladesh, Philippines, are included, as also other diasporas from other countries living outside India. The phenomena of double migration and return migration are also included. There are also papers on diasporic literature, poetry, and films. The program features, as Mahalingam said, both very senior scholars and young researchers, and this mix bodes well for the future of the field, as also to the future of GRFDT. My felicit felicitations to the team for putting together what promises to be a vibrant conference. The wide range of papers shows how development cannot be isolated from other aspects of diaspora. In the field, even now, fundamental concepts are being debated, revisited, sometimes redefined to keep pace with reality, which is changing at an unprecedented pace and scale. So even with a topic like development, which is substantially policy-oriented, the related conceptualizations and theorizations of diaspora, homeland, hostland, etc. come into play. In the social sciences and humanities, currently there is much attention on the impact of the social location of the researcher. There are at least four locations from which a scholar can engage with the field, as a diasporic himself or herself, or as a member of the hostland or homeland, and fourthly, from none of these locations. This conference positions itself, as we can see from the concept note and program schedule, largely from the vantage point of the homeland. The relationship of the migrant and the diaspora with the homeland is the crux of the conference theme, even though homeland is not mentioned in the title. The conceptual dimension of this relationship, homeland and diaspora and migrant, which I see as fluid and ambiguous, is what I plan to address today, asking the question, what motivates diasporas to contribute to development in the homeland? Migration and diaspora, the two key words in the conference title, have slightly different relationships with homeland. Migration has been studied for a long time in the social sciences, but the academic study of diaspora is of relatively recent origin. Migration encompasses both movement within the country and across national borders. Diaspora generally refers to people who migrate to live in another country, but that does not automatically make them a diaspora. When do migrants form a diaspora? This is a much debated question. The presence of diasporic consciousness is the key variable, and it can wax and wane under different circumstances. The third key word in the title of the seminar that is development, has different meanings when juxtaposed with domestic migration on the one hand and with diaspora on the other. In looking at domestic migration vis-a-vis -vis development, the important questions are about environmental impact, displacement of groups from their traditional habitat, homeland and livelihood, groups that are usually poor and from the margins of society. 
the role of corporate houses and the state in spearheading mega projects and pitting progress and development vis-a-vis -vis environment and equity is a tricky matter to resolve. The pitch for rehabilitation and sustainable development are only partial solutions and they often get stymied by tardy implementation. But importantly, this discourse rarely addresses the loss of home and homeland in what is essentially a forced migration, since this loss is intangible, although for the migrants it has real material and psychic costs. With reference to migration outside the country's borders, the usual question is about the role of the diaspora in development in the homeland through philanthropy, remittance, investment, NGO activity, initiating and or partnering in projects in business, technology, education, health and medicine. This latter on the diaspora and development is a rather recent question. For four decades after independence, as we know, the Indian government's attitude towards its diasporas was one of a little indifference or a subtle accusation of betraying the nation by leaving. Connections between individual families, individuals and families existed to the extent that technology, expenses and policies of that time enabled them. It is only in the 1990s that the government of India realized the potential of harnessing its diasporas for the benefit of the nation and initiated a new and proactive policy towards them. This is a well-known story to this audience and I will not go into the details. Suffice it to say that it has largely been an instrumental approach of harvesting diasporic wealth, success and political clout in their adopted countries for progress and development in India. Paradoxically, however, there is a widespread underlying assumption that the tie of nostalgia and affection is what persuades diasporas to offer help and support to the whole homeland. Such a construction of diaspora homeland relationship was implicit in the early phase of diaspora studies. As Cohen, Dufour and others have shown, migration did not severe ties with the country of origin. Homeland at that time was understood as a geographic space from which diasporas felt exiled, suffering a sense of loss and they were motivated by nostalgia for home and homeland with a desire for eventual return. This conception flows from the classic Jewish prototype where the cry was always next year in Jerusalem. It is primarily in this sense that the desire in diasporas to do philanthropy and engage in development projects in the homeland has been understood. Altruism is seen as the basic motivator for the diasporic contribution. However, as the field matured, the idea of a homeland as a concrete geographical territory came under question. Even though the myth of return may be maintained, it may also have other functions and actual return may not happen and may not be intended. Clifford, Hall, Safran and others argue that constructions of homeland are often oriented towards maintaining a sense of community within the diaspora rather than loyalty to any single territory. Moreover, in an age of hypermobility, it is possible for people to have hybrid identities belonging to their new home and also to the old homeland. The process is made smoother by some countries which now permit dual citizenship. With double and triple emigrations, diasporas have more than one homeland as a reference point. Gujarati emigration to East Africa in the 19th century, then to UK in the early 1970s and from there on to the US from the 1990s onwards is a vivid example. Moreover, the nature of the relationship changes with second and third generation immigrants. Research suggests that the first generation usually donates to its own regional linguistic <coughs> or religious groups, <coughs> while the second and third generation donors tend to give towards broader national concerns on sustainable development and avoid philanthropic activities that are religious and identity oriented. Diasporas cannot be seen as merely reflecting compulsions and pressures from the hostland or homeland. They carve out, in Homi Baba's phrase, a third space for themselves. The phenomena of reverse migration and return migration, which are growing trends, also change the relationship with homeland. 
For example, as Aparna Raya Prol shows, for the second generation young Indian American who comes to India on an IT assignment <coughs> and lives in one of the gated communities in Cyberabad, home and homeland refer to the United States that he has left behind. <coughs> All these factors have complicated our understanding of the concept of homeland. As Tololian puts it, we must be careful not to locate the diasporic's home in the ancestral home too easily. <coughs> Bombay pollution. Also Delhi pollution. <laughs> In fact, home and homeland are not quite the same. The feelings of loss and longing and the yearning to belong, belong can be for one's village or town or region. And in this sense, migrants within the country's borders also share the longing for home. It can also be for an unspecified location, for a kin group, for a set of primary group relationships that are lost. Thus the Hindi word desh can stand for country as well as for one's village, locality or region where it's the colloquial usage this. Home as a mythic place of longing and belonging can be seen in the migrants pining for this in the Bidesia and Pardesia songs in Bhojpuri or for that matter the young bride's songs of loss of mother's home Maika in the folk songs of UP and Bihar. Like Desh, Another term that fuses these two aspects of home and homeland is the German word Heimat and in the wake of the Syrian refugee crisis, the word Heimat is being used quite a lot in Germany these days. The homing desire is a universal sentiment and goes deeper than just homeland in the sense of one's country of birth. To use Avtar Bra's phrase, the homing desire is both about a mythic place of desire in the imagination as well as the lived experience in a specific locality or region. It is in the former sense of home as a spy primal space that nostalgia and emotion prevail. <coughs> The other aspect of home as homeland as a concrete geographical space is also capable of generating altruism. But often there are multiple motives in the diasporic's desire to support the homeland and there is nothing sinister about it. It is quite normal to the human condition. With tight migration policies and the lack of political recognition and social acceptance in the hostland, diasporas experience a renewed attachment to the homeland. There may also be guilt at leaving family behind to seemingly live the good life. Philanthropy, in fact, may be a compensatory mechanism for not returning nor wanting to return. <clears throat> On the other hand, it may also be in the nature of keeping one's options open by investing especially in real estate in, and housing. Vijay Varghese's work on investments in property by UK Punjabis in their villages and the consequent disputes and bloody feuds between relatives is a telling example of the very material considerations that can operate behind philanthropic activity. <coughs> the desire to be known and admired in one's village or school or neighborhood is also an important motive for first generation migrants. <coughs> Several philanthropic efforts and charities are directed towards or rooted through caste organizations in the diaspora, even though they may not be named as such. Many of the large and influential castes in the diaspora have huge transactional networks and philanthropy is part of their activities, but the essential function of these organizations is to help in creating business, social and matrimonial linkages, reaping the trust quotient which is seen as inherent in caste and kinship networks. Another interesting example that I would like to give is the rise of the IITs as a globally recognized Indian brand of skilled technologists. This phenomenon is a byproduct of a specific conjunction of events and circumstances at a specific time, long after the IITs were established, in which the IIT alumni in the US have played a significant role. Its genesis lies in the 1970s 
with the large scale migration of IITNs to the West, notably to the US, creating a talented diaspora placed in good academic and corporate positions. Devesh Kapoor's work has a lot of documentation of this phenomenon. The joke making the rounds at that time was that when a student enrolls in an IIT, his spirit is set to ascend to America. After graduation, his body follows. <laughs> but, the, but it was still not brand IIT at that point. The turning point for brand IIT was from the 1990s with the advent of globalization and new information technology. The critical mass of IIT alumni in the West, around 60,000 at that time, leveraged its initial educational and professional capital into spectacular entrepreneurship in the startup sector. This was also the time that economic liberalization changed the dynamics of Indian society. New links were forced between those IITians who had left for the US and those who stayed back, instead of the previous divide between us and them, the IITians who went abroad and who didn't, later on came together. Earlier, the links of the IIT diaspora with India had been personal and familial, not professional. Now they linked up with alumni in India, formed their own entrepreneurial networks, contributing to the Indian advantage in the IT and finance sector. Here, the comfort and trust level of the IIT diaspora with their alma mater and with the alumni in India worked in the form of enlightened self-interest in which altruism was only one part. The creation of the brand was a joint product of the IITs in India and the diaspora. The point I'm making is that the relationship between homeland and diaspora is complex and has multiple motivations mutually. The slippery slope between the primal mythic homing desire, the concrete village, locality or region, and a sovereign geographical and political homeland, this, this is a very slippery slope with a lot of fluidity and ambiguities. Changes in policy, generation, circumstances can be factors. The mutual dependence of social reality, policy, concepts, and theorization is what needs to be emphasized on, even in a conference like this, which is largely focusing on development policy. But let me conclude on an inspirational note and not talk about self-interest and enlightenment, enlightened self-interest, because it's not always the case. Let me give you an example of a really outstanding example of what can only be called sacrifice and service in the highest traditions of altruism. I'm talking about Dr. Chandra Sankuratri, who started the MSM Foundation, the Manjari Shankuratri Memorial Foundation, which is registered as a charity in Canada. It, it also has another foundation, the Shankuratri Foundation, which is an NGO in India, and the two are connected to each other. Through these two NGOs, uh, Dr. Chandra Shankuratri has adopted his native village, which is 10 kilometers from Kakinada town. He lives there. He works completely. He has left his job as a government biologist in Canada and has moved to Kakinada, though he has retained his Canadian citizenship. And the foundation collects money from Canadian citizens, from you and me. Uh, it doesn't have big funding. It has modest funding. But Shankuratri stays in Kakinada. He has built a primary school for children there. And then at the end of five years, when the children asked for a high school, he has also, also built a high school. Uh, the, there is a 100% uh, success of uh, students passing out from that school and that area is one where there is 50% illiteracy. He has also started an eye hospital which has done so far 160,000 free cataract surgeries. All services to the poor are <coughs> free. Uh, he invites his friends and other citizens from Canada to come and visit. There have been people from Gurdwara in Canada who came and saw what Sankuratri was doing, what were the kind of changes he made and they donated. The aspirations of the children have grown in that period from 89 to now and many of them have passed out, got married and their children have grown and so on. He has been personally overseeing, overseeing eye camps. He moves from crisis to crisis. He runs with tight shoes on all the time. In 1985, Dr. Shankuratri's family, his wife Manjiri and his son, six-year-old uh, Shrikiran and his daughter, three-year-old Sharda were on the flight, on the Kanishka flight, Air India flight, which uh, 
on which there was an explosion and everybody was uh, killed. So for a couple of years, Shankaratri was sort of in despair, not knowing what to do. And then he made this decision to move back to his village. So he says, and he has been uh, feted and felicitated by Canada as well as India. There is a film made by CBC on him. He says that he doesn't have any personal needs. He doesn't have any personal desires. He is there 24 by 7. He visits Canada once in three months for the board meeting of his foundation, where his friends then collect some donation and give it to him. He says, I don't have any personal needs. I don't exist. I'm content with what I'm doing. I want to send a message to the terrorists that despite them and their destruction, several good things have come out of it. Thank you.